Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the invitation, ladies and gentlemen. I've been working in the field of nanotoxicology for the last um, eight or nine years and had a couple of EU project grants. So I'm going to tell you something about what we know because I think it will help to frame the conversation about... Um, so we, we've already heard from colleagues that uh, there are many potential benefits and the secret is going to be to take the benefits but avoid the pitfalls. Um, and not leave a, a legacy for future generations. So I first started to learn about nanoparticles when I listened to David Jefferson, who's a crystallographer at Cambridge. And crystallographers know that when you take a material, it might be a bulk material like gold or platinum, which is pretty inert in the bulk condition, you start to reduce it down to particles of just a few hundred atoms. They become crystalline, you get vertices, and they start to get electrically charged. And chemistry is all about electrons. And indeed, this is the way we make heterogeneous catalysts. So we all drive around in motor cars, which have got catalytic converters and things. So what we know very little about, but are trying to learn as quickly as possible, is how this surface chemistry, Fenton chemistry, interacts with our own wet biochemistry. And I have to tell you, there are many more lacunae of ignorance than there are of knowledge. So the nanoscale is in this defined as this area of 1 to 100 nanometers. That's 10 to the minus 7 down to 10 to the minus 9 meters. And when you get down there, you're getting down to the size of molecules. So we can't really imagine it. But the size of protein molecules and things like that, these are all very much in the nanoscale range. And to observe them, you need microscopy. So there are a few people in this audience who probably could see a frog or a sight naked eye. I don't think I could anymore. Then to go down a bit further, you need a light microscope, but we're still not in the nanoscale. And here you need very high resolution electron microscopy or, or scanning probe microscopy. And you can see we're down in the, the size of viruses going right the way down to the size of globular proteins and amino acids. That's all in the nanoscale. And um, when, an an when particles come into the body, they take on a coating of biological, usually proteinaceous molecules, and that affects the way they behave. That's something else we have to take into account. Here's one. So life started about three and a half billion years ago, we're told, and, but it's only for about the last half a billion years that we've had multicellular life. And unicellular organisms make their living by engulfing material from their immediate environment. And of course many of our cells retain that and it's necessary for normal physiology. So what happens is that these particles are small enough to travel around very much like viruses. They use the same pathways as viruses. So what we're discovering is that once they get into the body, they can travel almost anywhere, admittedly in low doses. So there are two basic questions. Where do nanoparticles get to? And in what concentrations or quantities? And if they do get there, does it matter? The answer to the second question is actually much more difficult than the answer to the first. We're getting somewhere with question number one. So let's consider get, get breathing particles in, because actually we know quite a lot about the toxicology of aerosols. Um, we have a defense mechanism. There are, there's mucus on the upper respiratory, so if anything hits that, it impacts and doesn't come off. If it gets down lower into the trachea and the bronchi, there's a carpet of mucus being wafted up, and then you swallow it. If it gets right the way down into the terminal airways, then it tends to stay there and, and either be mopped up by patrolling cells, macrophages, um, or taken into the, or get across into the, directly into the blood. It's very interesting that apparently these patrolling macrophages have difficulty in recognizing as foreign things that are smaller than 65 nanometers. And what that probably tells us is that they were not a major problem in our evolutionary past. But um, they may be becoming more so now. So where do particles go? Here's a particle coming down. It goes right the way down here into the 
terminal airway. And here, these are, you can see fluorescent um, polystyrene nanoparticles have been mopped up by patrolling macrophages. It's very easy to overwhelm that system, though, with numbers of particles. And uh, just to put it in the right scale, here, oh, sorry, here, You can see um, this is blood and this is air, and that is the boundary between the two. It's very sensitive, this. And that's about 200 nanometers thick. And this is a nanoparticle just here. I actually cheated, it's four pixels. It should be one pixel, but you wouldn't see it. So um, you can see that actually that. It, it, this, this could get across there by the following sort of mechanisms. So we have um, what we're what we're trying to concentrate on now. Not in these bigger particles, but the minute little dots you can see there. So they're there in in, in very high number, but they weigh virtually nothing. So this mass index for assessing the effects of nanoparticles is very unsatisfactory. And we know from the pharmaceutical industry that if you breathe in an aerosol, here's the nanoscale from 1 to 100 nanometers, these things are almost designed to go straight down to the alveolus of your lung. That's where they are uh, maximally delivered. And the, um, there are a number of mechanisms which cells have innately for trafficking particles. Bigger ones are picked up by something called phagocytosis. But for nanoparticles, there are these pinocytotic endocytosing mechanisms which are going on continuously. So um, a fibroblast will typically change its whole surface area in about 45 minutes by this process. And this is the way that nanoparticles find their way through the body. It's the same mechanism as used by viruses. So we are wide open. And uh, these papers down here, I can give people references. We've been writing a, a report for the WHO Europe on this. Um, to liver, spleen, heart and brain, it's all been demonstrated. So roughly 10 to the minus 4 of the inhaled dose of nanoparticles will get into your brain. That's been now verified uh, by two different methods. This is a pulmonary macrophage uh, valiantly trying to consume some asbestos fibers. Just to emphasize that it's an innate quality of these cells to try and engulf. So if you're exposed, and here it's been shown also in the nasal epithelium, it gets directly into the brain, um, there are papers on that. So there is something about the size of particles and their toxicity, and I think this might have something to do with your soil data, with time, because the particles were probably dissolving and getting smaller. Yeah. So the smaller the particle, the higher the toxicity. This is work by Donaldson in his lab in Edinburgh. He looked at uh, carbon black of average size 14 nanometers, 15 nanometers, quarter of a micron. And this is a measure of the inflammatory response. Let's not bother how he did it. But you can see that the smaller they get, the higher the inflammatory response. And inflammation seems to be a very common response to particles, whatever they're made of. This was more of Donaldson's work. Here he's comparing titanium dioxide. The white is nanoparticles, and the black is bigger ones, up to 2.5 microns. And that's latex. And the inflammatory response is the same, and it's, it's actually associated with size rather than the composition. These are things we're all trying to find out about at the minute. This was worked by Gunter Oberderster. He heated Teflon up to 550 degrees and produced an aerosol of uh, PTFE. Um, so this is the fresh uh, aerosol. I think I've missed the slide out. Uh, yeah, this is the aerosol. The fresh aerosol is on the left. After about three minutes, the size distribution moves over to the right because you get agglomeration. So he exposed animals to sham and also to these two sorts of things. 
the toxicity of the smaller part of the fresh particles was acute. Uh, some of those animals died acutely. So again, this size phenomenon is to do with the surface activity and reactivity. And a common thing is to induce inflammation. So as toxicologists, we have to consider how they get in, where they get to, whether they're degraded, whether you can excrete them, and then whether they can have toxic effects. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about mechanism, possible mechanism <coughs> of toxic action. Um, the sites of uh, vulnerability might be uh, proteins, membranes in phospholipids, and these can have general toxic effects that we know about, genetic, carcinogenic, immunotoxic, reprotoxic. So, membranes are critical for the maintenance of homeostasis. So, um, aerobic respiration in mitochondria is, is very important for cellular activity. Protein synthesis, the accurate production of proteins, and that's what I want to dwell on because I think this is a real Achilles heel, um, is important, and then preservation of the genetic apparatus. So those are sites of a special uh, vulnerability. What are the possible mechanisms of toxicity? I've already mentioned catalysis. That's definitely one. Um, membrane perturbation can be through lipid peroxidation. There are quite a number of papers out there now showing that that occurs. And surfactant effects are also acting like a detergent. Chaperone effects. We make proteins by producing a long string of peptides in a chain and then they have to fold into secondary, tertiary, quaternary forms to be able to function properly. And nanoparticles are of a size to be able to get inside that folding process and mess it up. And I'll give you an example. So protein misfolding is a worry because there are consequences for chronic long-term disease, degenerative disease, and then direct physical damage, as for instance with asbestos fibers. So I'm going to give you some quick examples from the literature. There's loads out there, and we can point you at more. This was a paper by Foley, and they showed that these buckyballs, one nanometer fullerenes, uh, actually uh, induced damage by catalysis. This was a paper showing lipid peroxidation, paper by Kamat, in, in cells. Um, this is a surfactant effect of naturally produced nanoparticles of misfolded um, amyloid protein, paper by Cottingham. This is the one I want to spend a little bit more time on. Um, when proteins fold, they have chaperoning proteins which help with the process. And um, it seems that the chaperoning can be messed up. So these are diesel particles, they're only a few nanometers across. That's the centriole of a cell where a particular sort of protein called tubulin is produced. Now you can see that a particle of that size could easily get inside that mechanism. They're of that sort of size. It's just to emphasize this. So I'm going to give you three quick examples. One where nothing happens, one where you actually make the protein it won't work anymore, and another one where you enhance the function. So it's actually very unpredictable what's going to happen. That's the message. So we've been here, we've stuck a gold nanoparticle onto a, an antibody, and then we use it on an electron micrograph to identify a protein. So the, the antibody is still working. The nanoparticle has not made any difference. In this paper by um, Bilston, they've uh, kept <coughs> human carbonic anhydrase 2 enzyme with uh, silicon nanoparticles of 9 nanometers. This circular dichroic spectrum changes. The conformation of the protein completely changes. It becomes inactive. In this paper, now, but I should say at this stage, there are 42 known human um, protein misfolding diseases, and they include Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, spongiform encephalopathy. Uh, they're, mainly, they're mainly in the central nervous system because here cells cannot reproduce. You, you're left with the neurons you were born with. And so if you misfold protein, there are mechanisms in neurons for internalizing it 
uh, in graveyards, um, lipofuscin granules and Lewy bodies and things, which have to stay there for the rest of your life. So the question is, if you do something which um, gradually increases, just slightly increases the rate of protein misfolding in a long-lived species such as humans, does that mean that you may see the earlier onset of some of these chronic degenerative diseases? That's a question. We've, we've just completed an EU project called NeuroNano where we were looking at this in mice, but it was only six months of exposure. That might not be long enough to actually see any. We didn't find anything. But it's a reasonable question. Um, okay. And then uh, this was another uh, paper where actually by putting it with uh, amino philic hydrogel nanoparticles, this carbonic anhydrase, it actually imparted to it an ability to uh, exist in higher temperatures. Very odd. Physical damage, uh, carbon nanotubes are known to induce granuloma formation. So that's an example of physical damage. Now the thing is, that's different between the GM debate, where it was a completely novel technology. We had no prior information at all. When particles came along, and the nanotech industry started saying, we're going to save the world, basically, with lots of these products, a number of us were jumping up and down saying, hang on, we know there's a massive literature out there showing that particles can damage health. It's aerosol science. So these are a series of studies which look at increased mortality this has already been mentioned by others this morning, this, this effect, um, for increasing uh, aerosol concentration of particles. And they all point the same way. Some are statistically significant, some aren't. But everyone accepts the work of Kunzli and Dockery and Pope, these massive studies which show that um, exposure to particles over a lifetime will have chronic and acute on chronic effects on mortality. So, the nanotech industry has to answer that. And the first wave of nanotech products have all been bulk powders. And some of these now, nanotubes for instance, are being produced in thousands of tons per annum on a worldwide basis. So this is major industrial production. Uh, and we know that air pollution is associated with lung cancer. So that's a good question is, could exposure to nanoparticles lead to that sort of thing? Um, this has already been mentioned by the previous speaker in the last session. This was a paper by Poland et al. They've exposed um, animals to multi-walled nanotubes, which are stiff. And if they got over a certain aspect ratio, then they could induce this granulomatous inflammation. And that is a precursor. That's what it looks like if you're going to develop uh, a mesothelioma. And at about the same time, this paper in Japan by Tagaki and his co-workers showed a very similar finding. Now I can remember sitting in a meeting in 2004 in Brussels and someone said, well these nanotubes, could their fibres, could they not act in an asbestos-like fashion? And people said, oh there's no evidence for that. But that's an example of hazard identification which is now starting to be characterised. So if we have the ability to identify hazards, we ha it, it, it's incumbent upon us to actually look in to see whether there's anything in it. Okay, so, well, I guess my final thing is to return to the topic of tomorrow and say the first written evidence of asbestos being damaging was in 1898. But by 1930 we knew as sure as hell that it was damaging. And so there's 1930. This is the imports of asbestos into the UK. And that's the predicted deaths from mesothelioma as a result of that activity, and the worst is yet to come. So I, I guess what we don't want to do is to leave that sort of legacy. We have to be very careful to make sure that if we're going to develop these products, and I can see that they could be very, very useful, that we do not actually make the place worse. We take the benefits, but we're very, very careful to make sure the right risk assessments are done. And, you know, the, the impetus to push this thing forward as fast as possible is coming from a profit motive from the industry, which we can understand, but we don't necessarily, as a society, have to go at the speed that they're trying to dictate. Thank you. That's what I want to say.